With the amount of mayhem drop, we got many new fun things in the game, which you've no doubt already seen everything about in my update video. But we also got many new fun things for pack makers in data pack version 94 and resource pack version 75, including a new system for environment attributes. My name is Sly Slime, and this is a guide to all those news. Let's start with those new environment attributes. They're a way to control aspects of visuals, audio, and gameplay using attributes referenced from biomes and dimensions, or sometimes a mix of both. They can also be affected by a new concept called timelines, as well as by the built-in weather. This is a new experimental system that replaces a number of previous mechanics, like tags and specific fields. Both dimension types and biomes now have a new attributes field where environment attributes can be specified, with each field in that object being the namespaced ID of an attribute and its value depending on the type of that attribute, similar to the representation of data components for items. Common value types of attributes include booleans, particle options, and colors, both variants with and without an alpha channel. The way different attributes interact if the same attribute exists on both a dimension and a biome is determined by its modifier type. If none is specified, the higher priority value simply overrides the lower priority one, but you can also use different modifier types like different boolean operators for booleans, different arithmetic operators for floats, and different blending modes for colors. Smooth transitions are based on the biomes within an 8 block radius of the position and weighed depending on the distribution of biomes within that volume. Timelines are a new registry type with JSON files in the timeline folder. Each timeline has a period measured in ticks and a number of environment attribute tracks. Those tracks each then have keyframes for how that particular environment attribute should be set at that keyframe time and interpolation settings for the easing between them. The easing is controlled by the ease field on each track and controls how changes apply in between the keyframes, and has 32 different modes. And in addition to the predefined 32 modes, you can also define a cubic base year spline segment by specifying its control points. This version also brings a number of new environment attributes in use with the timelines. They include new attributes for many aspects of the sky related to time, including aspects of the sun, moon, and stars. Some of the new environment attributes control the time-based functionality of how blocks work, like the openness of eye blossoms and the chance that a turtle egg will hatch. And finally, a number of them control mob-related behaviors, like when a creaking is active, what activities villagers do at various times, and the spawn chance of slimes on the surface. The way that timelines are activated is related to some of the changes to dimension types. They no longer have natural or effects fields, instead relying on a timelines field, which is a timeline ID, list of timeline IDs, or hash prefixed timeline tag. The remaining pieces of dimension type effects that are not controlled by timelines are now the skybox, which can be set separately, the cardinal light field, and the fixed time field has been replaced by a has fixed time boolean. The vanilla dimensions now also have built-in timeline tags, together with a universal tag that is active in all of them. Ultraworm has been split into three new attributes. Water evaporates, fast lava, and default dripstone particle. Bed works has been moved to the bed rule attribute, and respawn anchor works is now its own boolean attribute. Piglin safe has been turned into the piglin's zombify attribute, and has raids is now the can start raid attribute. The cloud height field is now a cloud height attribute, and there's also a cloud color attribute. The spawning of zombified piglins from portals has been separated from the natural setting into its own attribute. Some of these attributes will have a different format than the old field on the dimension type. A couple of previously hard-coded dimension properties are now also environment attributes, fog start and end distance attributes, and those have also been accompanied by a water fog start distance and end distances for sky fog and cloud fog. On custom biomes, the fog color, water fog color, and sky color are now all visual environment attributes. The particle setting is now the ambient particles attribute, and all the music and sound settings have been migrated into the ambient sounds, background music, and music volume attributes. Just like for dimension types, the format of these settings might not be the same as the old biome fields. Some biome tags have also been replaced by environment attributes. Snow Golem melts, 
increased fire burnout and has closer water fog. The Place Underwater Music biome tag has been replaced by a new setting on the background music attribute. The Without Patrol Spawns biome tag has been removed. When it comes to environment attributes on biomes, note that some of the attributes are not evaluated at the position, which means they cannot be affected by a biome. Let's move on to commands and the new stopwatch command. This is a command that lets you track and test for the passage of real time, that is a timer that is not coupled to the update speed of the game. This command is intended to replace the cases where the movement of the world border has been used to measure such time passing. You can use stopwatch with a namespaced ID to create, query, restart and remove stopwatches. Stopwatch query returns the current stopwatch time and takes an optional scale parameter. So a scale of 1 will return the number in seconds, and a scale of 1000 will return the number of milliseconds. Reading the time using query is not the way to test the stopwatch. That is instead done through a new subcommand form of execute, execute if or unless stopwatch. This takes the ID of the stopwatch to test and then a range of time in which the execute should continue. The world border command has changed in this version, or more specifically, the way the world border interpolates has changed. World borders previously moved based on real time, ignoring the tick rate of the server. This meant that if your server lagged, the world border became out of sync with the rest of the gameplay, even moving when the game was paused, which is now fixed. This behavior was also sometimes abused to get a measure of the real passing of time, something which can now instead be replaced by using the new stopwatch command. Together with this, the time argument for the world border command is now specified in ticks rather than in seconds by default, and now accepts time suffixes, so you can now use 20s to mean 20 seconds. This means commands from previous versions can be upgraded by adding an s suffix. Let's move on to item components. A number of new ones have been added. The use effects component controls the impact on player movement that using the item has. It has three fields. Can sprint, which is a boolean denoting whether the player can sprint while using the item. Interact vibrations for whether the item emits vibrations. And speed multiplier, which is a multiplier to the player's movement speed applied while the item is active. The minimum attack charge component defines how much of the attack indicator needs to be filled before an attack can be made with the item. This ranges from 0, meaning that there is no limit, to 1, meaning that the bar has to be entirely full. The damage type component specifies which damage type a weapon deals. The format is the namespaced ID of the damage type. The swing animation component specifies the animation used when the item is swung, that is used for an attack or breaking a block. It has two fields. Type specifies the type of swing to use, one of none, whack and stab. And the duration field specifies the duration of the swing in ticks. There's now an attack range component controlling some of the behaviors of weapons. Min reach and max reach define the ray segment where the attack is effective. Min creative reach and max creative reach control the reach of the item for attacks in creative mode. Hitbox margin is an additional range added to the hitbox of target entities when checking for impact. And mob factor is a multiplier for the range values that applies when the weapon is used by a mob. Kinetic weapon can be added to an item to make it work as a weapon that deals damage along a ray every tick based on relative speed while the item is in use. Delay ticks is the number of ticks the item has to be used before it starts being able to deal damage. Contact cooldown ticks specifies how long after a hit before another hit can be made. Damage multiplier is a multiplier for the final damage based on relative speed. Forward movement specifies the distance the item animates out of the hand while the attack is active. And sound and hit sound specify the sound event IDs of sounds to play when the weapon is engaged and hits an entity. There are also three condition fields. Damage conditions, knockback conditions and dismount conditions. Each of these have three fields. Max duration ticks is the maximum number of ticks that the weapon can be active for that result to be possible. Main speed is the minimum speed the attacker has to be moving at for the result to be possible. And min relative speed is the minimum difference in speed between the attacker and target for the result to be possible. 
The piercing weapon component has also been added and works similarly to kinetic weapon, but instead of enabling a constant action, it enables a quick attack when the item is swung. It also has sound and hit sound fields that work exactly like those in kinetic weapon. Two booleans control the effects of the attack, deals knockback and dismount. Those were all the new components, but there are also a couple of changed ones. The consumable component animation value Spear has been renamed to Trident, and Spear has now been added for the actual Spear. And the intangible projectile component now shows an intangible text in the item tooltip. Let's shift our attention to predicates and start with component predicates. Component predicates can now be used to check for the existence of a component. This is done using an empty object as the value for the predicate, that is a predicate with no fields. This works both as part of an item, block or entity predicate as well as directly in item predicates for commands. The flags entity predicate has been extended in this version with two new checks. Is in water allows the predicate to check for entities in or out of water, and is fall flying allows the predicate to check if entities are flying with Elytra. Loot tables now have a new ability to source the contents of equipment slots using a new slot sources concept in a new slots loot pool entry. Slot sources are a typed object with six different types. The slot range slot source selects slots in a range from the inventory of an entity or a block entity. The group slot source merges several slot sources into one. The contents slot source selects all non-empty slots from the inventory component of one or more items. The filtered slot source applies an item predicate to the items in slots provided by another slot source and provides only the matching ones. The limit slots slot source limits the number of returned slots from another slot source. And the empty slot source selects no slots. There are also news for loot item functions. There's a new one called Discard that simply replaces any item stack with nothing. It has no fields. The filtered function has also been modified. Instead of a modifier field, there is now two fields called onPass and onFail, which are both either a single function or a list of functions to run. There's now also a new advancement trigger called Spear Mobs for attacks using a spear with fields for the player and number of mobs. This pack version also contains news for enchantments. There's a new effect component in this version called Post Piercing Attack for entity effects that apply after an attack with a piercing weapon. There's also a new entity effect in this version called Apply Impulse, which applies an impulse to the targeted entity. It has three fields. Direction specifies the direction of the impulse in local entity space, that is X is left, Y is up and Z is forward as the entity is rotated. The coordinates scale fields applies a world space scaling along the X, Y and Z axis. And the magnitude field is a level based value that scales the magnitude of the resulting impulse. There is a new entity effect called apply exhaustion which applies exhaustion to the targeted entity. This only works on players, since players are the only entities that have exhaustion in the first place. There's one field on this effect, amount, which is a level based value determining the amount of exhaustion to add. The play sound entity effect has also been changed to support a list of sound events, which are picked per level. That is the first sound is used for level 1, and so on. If the level is higher than the number of sounds, the last sound is used. There's also a new level based value called exponent, which raises the base value to the power of the power value. Game rules are now a registry type, which means they have namespaced IDs and all the game rules have been turned into lowercase snake case. A number of the game rules have been renamed further than simple conversion to snake case as shown on screen now. And as part of this, the game rules that previously disabled things have been inverted to instead enable those things. This of course now also means you'll need to switch any true to false and the other way around. The do fire tick and allow fire ticks away from player game rules have been removed and replaced with a single fire spread radius around player. Setting this to negative one allows fire spread anywhere. Setting it to zero disables fire spread and setting it to a positive value sets the radius around a player that fire can spread. A number of game rules now also have limits to their values. This generally represents the range of values that were previously actually used by the game. In a related change, the game rules fields for test environments have also been updated. This version introduces zombie nautilus variants. 
They are a data-driven variant registry just like other mob variants with the usual model, asset ID and spawn conditions fields. In this case, model is one of normal and worm. In Entity Data News, the fields for anger have changed, with angry at renamed to lowercase snake case and anger time replaced by a new anger and the time, which specifies a timestamp in game time ticks rather than a remaining time. A new damage type in this version, the spear damage type. And plenty of changes to tags. There is a can glide through block tag, which does exactly what it says on the tin. New knotless related item tags taming items, food, and the bucket food. There's also an item tag for camel husk food item. There's also a spears item tag, and the enchantability tags for swords have been split and remade into melee weapon and sweeping, with the addition of lunge as well. And in entity type tag news, there are new additions. Burn in daylight, can float while ridden, nautilus hostiles, and can wear nautilus armor and a spawns coral variant zombie nautilus biome tag has been added. And with that we can turn our attention to the resource pack news in version 75. Of course this contains a whole host of new textures and definitions for the new items and entities, but also a new entity equipment layer, camel husk saddle. The block and item texture atlases have been split. This means now all block model textures must come from the blocks atlas, and all textures used by an item model must come from the same atlas. There's a new texture atlas in this version, Celestials, containing the sun and moon textures as well as end flashes. There's also a change to the texture section of MC Metafile, which now has a new field called Mipmap Strategy. This lets you select between 5 modes, Mean, Dark Cutout, Cutout, Strict Cutout or Auto, with Auto being the default. There's also an alpha cutoff bias field, controlling how the texture cutouts change at lower mipmap levels. Leather horse armor has been split into two layers, with a tinted base layer and an untinted top layer like other leather armor pieces. And undyed glass blocks, glass panes and redstone dust now support translucent textures. In item model news, there's a new option for all item models called Swap Animation Scale, which is a float that indicates how fast the item moves up and down when swapping items in the hotbar. This is a scaling value with a default of 1. And block models can now be rotated in more ways than before, adding rotations along multiple axes and allowing larger angle values. And in text news, the Unifont library used for the Unicode font in the game has been upgraded to version 17.0.01 from version 16.0.03, which includes some new glyphs for Unicode 17, among other fixes and tweaks. Shaders have been updated in this version with a new block, vertex and fragment shader split from the terrain one to enable the new chunk fading. There are a set of new shaders for GPU side sprite animation, there are new uniforms for animation sprites and chunk sections, and the globals uniform now has camera coordinates. And that's all for these pack versions. Thank you very much for watching until the end, and if you found this helpful, please do poke that like button. It really helps out the channel. My name is Sliced Lime, and I'll see you next time.